Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Mindy Wright, a member of the CMC Board of Trustees, and I'm Assistant Provost at Ohio State. It's great to see everybody here today. Today, our forum, Authors, Books, and Libraries, the next chapter, is brought to us with support from Columbus State Community College and the Columbus Foundation. Please join me in thanking our sponsors and help me welcome Michael Wilkos of the Columbus Foundation to the stage for a special announcement and to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Mindy. It is my pleasure to represent the Columbus Foundation as we support the mission of the Columbus Metropolitan Club to engage people and ideas in community conversations. I'm pleased to share some fantastic news for our community. If you haven't already heard, the Big Give is back. Yay. In 2011 and 2013, the Columbus Foundation's 24-hour online giving event raised a combined $19.1 million for 569 local charities. And Jane happened to mention to me at our table that the Columbus Metropolitan Club just happens to be one of those charities that you could donate to. <clears throat> but the success of the event is only possible with generous support of donors like you through the compelling mission of Central Ohio nonprofits. The Big Give is an amazing opportunity for us to show our community spirit to give and to demonstrate how big-hearted Central Ohio is. This year's bonus pool is the largest ever at 1.3 million. So be ready to strengthen our community when the Big Give kicks off at 10 a.m. on May 12th. Thank you for your support, and may this be the biggest Big Give ever. All of us attending CMC today are fortunate to have the opportunity to hear, at one time and in one place, leaders from three respected institutions of the written word. With rich histories and strong engagement in our community, our mission today will be to explore what the future hold, holds as the craft, the tools, and the distribution of the written word evolves. Please welcome the Associate Director of Children's Education at Thurber House, Meg Brown, the Chief Customer Experience Officer at Columbus Metropolitan Libraries, Allison Circle, and our host and moderator, the Executive Director of the Ohioana Library, David Weaver. Please help me welcome all of our speakers. <laughs> David, the podium is yours, and um, I'd like for you to open us up today with a special treat. Uh, well, yes. Yes, indeed. I, uh, I uh, made a promise um, to a good friend. I was told I couldn't mention her initials, but she's involved with the Metropolitan Club and her initials are JB. Um, that, uh, that I would uh, open with a song, a part of, uh, it was mentioned, if you see in my introduction, I, was, I have sung with Opera Columbus and Columbus Light Opera. And so I promised that I would uh, uh, do a song we were trying to think of something that would entail the, uh, the topic of the day. So we were thinking maybe marrying the librarian um, or, or uh, Rogers and Hart, if they asked me, I could write a book. Um, but uh, ultimately, I, uh, with this week being the Ohio Book Festival, I didn't quite have the time to prepare as much as I would like. So I thought I would sing my theme song. I think everybody should have a theme song. And long ago, I picked uh, that my theme song would be Oh, What a Beautiful Morning from Oklahoma, not Ohio, but, uh, but uh, because I love the optimistic words by Oscar Hammerstein II. I love the melody by Richard Rogers. It's written for a baritone, which I am. And so even though it is 39 degrees and showers outside, and so it really does it, uh, so I'm, I'm going to sing uh, one chorus of Oh, What a Beautiful Morning, a verse. And then, you are all going to join me on a reprise. So, oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. I got a beautiful feeling. Everything's going my way. There's a bright golden haze on the meadow. There's a bright golden haze on the meadow. The corn is as high as an elephant's high. 
And it looks like it's climbing clear up to the sky. Everyone. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. I got a beautiful feeling. Everything's going my way. Big finish, hey. Oh, what a beautiful day. Thank you. Thank all of you. Well, you've already heard the introductions of our speakers, so I'm going to turn the podium over now to Allison Circle, who is going to talk about all of the exciting things which are going on at one of the truly great libraries of this country. We are also proud of it, the Columbus Metropolitan Library. Allison, it's yours. Well, you probably all don't know, but I'm a graduate of the University of Oklahoma. So, thank you. Um, so, and my mom was from there, so, good, yeah, right. So, first off, thank you all for coming today, and it's really a pleasure to be here. And what I want to start off with is thanking those authors who did those books, because dang, don't we love books. So, thank you, and thank the publisher. I had a great conversation with Ann Hagedorn, who I read all her books, so read her books. Um, really a great, because we'd have no libraries if we didn't have books, so thank you, and thank you for publishing them. Um, I also want to thank my, our team from the library here, because whatever I talk about today, I am the mouthpiece. They're, uh, they're the people who help make it happen, and thanks to our architect partners who are here in town. So I have 10 minutes. Oh, you stole my clock. Okay, I got to watch my 10, because what I'm going to talk about is the library's next chapter, and we are building that today. And I want to talk about not so much the what we're doing, but the why we're doing and to give you some insights in the thinking and how we are imagining what libraries are going to uh, be in the near future. And I have 10 minutes, I have nine topics. So let's see if I can speak in the bullet points that I've practiced. So if, uh, if you wanna follow along and time me, this sheet has our guiding principles. And I wanna talk to you a little bit about the thoughtfulness that went into these principles. And then if you drive by our new driving park branch, which is on here in the Near East Side, our new Whitehall branch, which just opened a week ago uh, Saturday. We're renovating the ma main library. We've got Northside, Hilliard, Dublin, Northern Lights, Parsons, and I'm sure I forgot something else, but they are all in action now. But as you, as you look at those, and I hope visit those, think about these principles, and you'll have an understanding about why we made the decisions that we did. So the first one, timing myself, is transparency. And what we mean by that is that as a community, you can see into what's happening in the library. I always think, gosh, we've got these bricks, little windows. How, do, how does a kid who needs help with homework have the courage to walk in and not know what's going on? What we're trying to do is be very active to the street my architect terms, I see Mike Suriano, he uses that term all the time. How do we activate it on the street so that as a, as a kid walks by, they say, I could do that. And isn't that interesting? So it's, it's to invite people to welcome, to demystify what's happening inside. In addition, glass has really changed. And before we were taking a precious commodity in an agrarian community, you couldn't afford books, so you kept them in a dark little spot so they were protected. We don't need to do that today. So we need to break down that thinking about creating these barriers and making ourselves welcome to the community. Another one is flexibility. Have you ever renovated your home and the moment you're done, you think, dang, I should have put the, the door over here. <laughs> my husband, we just redid our bathroom, and my husband is just beside himself because he allowed the contractor to tell us to put the door a different way. So he's all beside himself on that. We know the moment we open these buildings, we're going to say, we really need to do this, or here's a new opportunity. We need to be flexible so that these spaces can change. If you look at our branches that we created in our first building program, we have a lot of um, spaces, rooms, walls. 
these buildings don't have walls. They have areas, they have zones, but they're intentionally created to give us the maximum flexibility to adapt and change over the course of time. That's something libraries have been great at from eternity, is always adapting and changing to the community need. Another thing that is really important to us is iconic design. Now, great, we want a really great building, and isn't that inspiring, but why do we want iconic design? A few years ago, about 2008 or nine, we put new um, uh, monumental signs outside for the library. Here's the library sign. Before, they were very discreet and a little hard to see. They were navy blue, and now they're orange and green, and they have some neon on them, and they're really bright. And you know what customers said to us? They said, I never knew that was a library. So if we are, proud, and to borrow Mayor Coleman's phrase of swagger, if we're proud about being democracy's best, press, best kept promise, shouldn't we be loud on the street? Shouldn't we say this is a public building and we're here, we're here to stay, and we are here helping to transform a community? So be brazen about it. We're really pushing to do that. Another thing I'll tell you is um, we're getting some pushback from one of our communities who wanted a little brick and you know, want a really traditional, like a New England style library. And so I thought, well, how am I gonna help this community understand that's not what we're gonna deliver here? So, um, <laughs> Try to, try to, okay, I try to be persuasive. So I took a piece of paper and I had two pieces, two things on them. One side was a very traditional um, library. I grew up in Worthington and that, the old building used to be the Worthington Library on the square. I actually went there. So it looked a lot like that. The other was a very modern, bold design. And I took it to South High School. And I said, I want to ask you, of these two buildings, which one do you think was more interesting to you? Nine out of 10 times, it was the modern building. The other said, well, that's just, you know, whatever. That looks like everything else. And so if we're building buildings for that next generation, we ought to be building what the kids can imagine. And if we sell short for that, we're selling them short. So that's what that iconic design is all about. Sustainability, well, What's more sustainable than borrowing books, right? We're the ultimate recycler. So um, our community is also very interested in sustainability. Um, we are very mindful of uh, good use of taxpayers' dollars. So all of our buildings, our first two buildings, we're working towards LEED certification. We're looking at um, utility and water uh, efficiencies. Even the chairs in the kids' area are made of recycled Coke cans. And that's part of the storytelling about the building. So that's really important to us. Technology is the next one. I sat probably one, two, three, four, four tables back in this room a few years ago. And a grand dowager, not to be named, of Columbus turned to me. I was impressed she asked this question. She said, what the heck is the library doing now that there's the internet? And I said, well, let me tell you. And what I mentioned that about is the internet hasn't stopped our business at all. In fact, when we opened our, bu our building in Whitehall the other, uh, other Saturday, the very first thing, the hordes of people coming in, and the first question I got is, where are the computers? Because not everybody has the access we do. The library plays a pivotal role in providing access to communities who don't have it. We walk a really fine line between providing great technology, but not providing technology too far over here that is for a rarefied group that isn't, that's so changeable that we're investing taxpayer dollars in. We need to provide what our community needs. So if you go to Driving Park in Whitehall, you'll see great computers, you'll see smart boards in lots of rooms, you'll see iPads in the kids area to help give that flavor and taste of what that experience is like but we're not having gesture technology so that when you walk in, you hear the books I want. You know, we're trying to be very thoughtful about it. 
Um, the other thing is innovative programming. I'm so proud I talked to our partners here at uh, Columbus State to say, you're in my remarks today, because the library is great at providing convening space. But, and we have really smart people who work for us, but we don't know everything. We don't know how to teach computer code, for example. We have worked uh, in designated rooms in both Driving Park and Whitehall with Columbus State. They are embedded in our buildings. And as we have kids who come in and work on their homework or work to be better in school, how great does that transparency come into play that I can see people down in another room working on getting their degree at Columbus State? Or this, this uh, partner we have in town, AWH, who are the most altruistic people. They are all about computer development. They are going into needy communities, using the library and using our space to teach coding classes, to find promising people who never understood they had that aptitude, and they put them into a internship program with 100% <coughs> guaranteed job placement. So yeah, huh, isn't that something? So those are the kinds of things that these buildings can provide. The, um, so that kind of innovative programming that we don't have to deliver at all, we can bring people together to deliver that to better our community. Customer experience, of course it's on there, that's in my title, right? I better talk about that. Um, one of the things, I hope I don't offend our architects, but we talk about our space and we say, oh, there's a service desk right here, you know? And um, the desk, in one case, it was 18 feet long. And we said, it needs to be this big because we're not about serving our customers from behind a desk where you have to come up to me to ask a question. It's about relationship building. If kids are coming to the library and they have to come up to a desk and ask a question, that's not going to inspire them to come back. But if they have people coming up to them, talking to them, developing relationships, that's what sells a library experience. So we're trying to build these buildings that don't have big desks, our people don't sit down behind the desk. We've been moving towards that model for years. This really gives us the opportunity to start anew and do that. So I got a couple minutes left, I'm rushing through here. Young Minds, the kids in our community, oh my gosh, y'all, they need us so badly. You know, reading is so hard, you forget that. And um, I just feel bad about it. Um, I'm a crier, you can cry too. <laughs> um, but gosh, how do we make these spaces where kids wanna come in and learn? And it's environmental literacy, it's not just books on the shelf, but how do we make everything in that be a signal to help kids learn to read and to recognize that letters spell a word? You all know that, but when you're three, you don't know that, and you have no books in your home. So these spaces are supposed to be uplifting and magnificent, and we work really hard to make that happen. And then last, showcase our collection, because it is about books, right? And books are still really critical at our driving park branch, the first thing people went in. Same, same size collection, people said, where are all the books? And they were still there, but the space had gotten bigger because the convening space is bigger. And I'm really proud to stand here today and tell you a year later that our circulation at Driving Park is three times what it was a year ago, and the number one category is kids' books. So, <laughs> thanks to my team, our team. So, you know, you think it through, you think about that next generation, and we were talking books and libraries are here to stay for a long time because the need is always so great, and um, it's a great honor and privilege to be able to represent that here today. So thank you. Thank you, Allison. Thank you for sharing all the exciting things going on at CML. And now I would like to ask my pal, Meg Brown, um, to get up and talk about Thurber House. Thank you. you. I almost had a Jennifer Lawrence moment and <laughs> tripped over my own chair. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for having me here. I have to admit, I'm a little out of my comfort zone. I am used to working with um, students. I can't sing. Like David, I do have a Thurber Camp writing song that goes to the tune of the Brady Bunch. If you guys want to hear it later, I will share that with you. <laughs> or not. Trust me, not. Um, I have been with Thurber House for nine years, and it is an amazing place to work. It's an embarrassment of riches. I will be um, short and sweet. 
but um, we have the honor of um, remembering James Serber and doing um, programs and tours um, at his house and doing readings of his in the community and continuing his legacy of humor, um, not in just Columbus, but um, in New York when we do the American, um, Thurber Prize for American Humor. So we get to live in the past at Thurber House with the ghosts mm -hmm. and um, relish in his legacy, but then we also get to celebrate the present as um, Ohioan and the libraries do. We get to feature the biggest and brightest and best authors with our Evenings with Authors programs throughout the year, with our literary picnics in the summer where we also um, honor local Ohio authors. And then you know we have the American Prize for Humor um, that's awarded every year. So we get to do the past, we get to do the present, and we also get to do the future, which is my favorite part, um, where we get to have classes from everything from our preschool program, um, our Write and Ready program that's in several of um, the Metropolitan Libraries, all the way through high school. We have high school programs, and we even have adult writing programs. So all of you guys out there who have your books in your closet because you want to be an author, you can still come out and write. We have programs for everybody. And um, we, we celebrate emerging authors with our um, Children's Writer in Residency program. It's for emerging middle grade authors. And they go off to do amazing things. Lisa Yee and um, Alan Silberberg have gone off to win awards and continue to write and come back to Thurber House and say hi. And um, I mean, we just, we do a little bit of everything, and we get as passionate and excited about writing and reading as Alice does here, as David does with Ohioana, and I come from a very small town in Michigan. Yes, the state of Michigan. <laughs> Thank you, Xenia. I went to Michigan State, so we had the same enemy. Um, <laughs> Um, but I came from a very, very small town in Michigan. Um, my library was half the size of this after it was rebuilt. So um, Columbus really is such an embarrassment of riches with, um, with Thurber House, of course, I think, with Ohioana and with the library system. We are in almost all of the metro libraries with preschool programs, iPad programs, high school programs, and it's an amazing, amazing um, city. You guys should be very proud, and um, I know I am. I brag about it, and my mom is very jealous. She came from a town um, that just had a bookmobile. So um, it's an honor and a privilege to talk about books up here today and talk about the future of publishing because it is here to stay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. Well, this is my chance to talk briefly about my, my organization, then I'm going to jump back over and, uh, and have a little discussion. And uh, in a short while, we'll have questions from the audience as well. Um, the Ohio Anna Library uh, celebrated its 85th anniversary last year. And uh, Ohio Anna was started uh, by a first lady, Martha Kenny Cooper, in 1929, because she thought there should be a collection of books by Ohio writers and on Ohio subjects at the Ohio Governor's Residence. And that, from that simple idea, the Ohioana Library was born. We have grown over the years. We have added the Ohioana Quarterly, copies of which uh, I've left out there. So if you've never seen the Ohio, this is our official Ohioana Book Festival edition. We do awards. And uh, this Saturday coming up will be the ninth annual Ohio in a Book Festival. And we're very excited. We are moving downtown. We have outgrown two spaces. And uh, so we're gonna be at the Sheridan Columbus at Capitol Square. Um, from 10 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. on Saturday. It's free and open to the public. We'll be 106 authors, and I am so grateful and delighted that, uh, that the Columbus Metropolitan Club enabled us to bring a dozen of those authors here today, and I do want to recognize them because they're seated out in the community. On the uh, fiction side, we try to bring something for everybody on fiction. Yolanda Tonette Sanders, um, author of Day of Atonement. Yolanda, you're out there. Oh, you're over there. Okay. Lucy Snyder, author of Shooting Yourself in the Head for Fun and Profit, a writer's survival guide. <laughs> Cindy Thompson, uh, author of Annie Stories. Andrew Welsh Huggins, Slow Burn, the second of the Andy Hayes mysteries. Uh, in nonfiction, we have Emily Foster, the Ohio State University District of Neighborhood History. Emily, you're out there. Uh, Anne Hagedorn, The Invisible Soldiers, um, How America Outsourced Our Security. Lee Leonard, James A. Rhodes, Ohio Colossus. Lee, longtime writer for the Columbus Dispatch, yes. David Myers, Kahiki Supper Club, A Polynesian Paradise in Columbus. Wouldn't you just love one time to have the mystery drink back? 
Uh, yes. Sandra Gervis, Myths and Mysteries of Ohio. Sandy over there. Uh, in the genre of young adult juvenile literature, Aaron McCann, Love and Other Foreign Words. Aaron. Edith Patu, Ghosting. Edie. And finally, our one representative, our lone poet. Poets are often alone. Darren Demery. Uh, thank you all, and we hope that you will all come out for the festival. Uh, and one thing I have to say, we're kind of kind of bragging and stuff because you know this event uh, was first presented in 2007, and has grown from 10 authors and 600 attendees to 106 authors and 3,000 plus attendees. This is now the single largest literary event in the state of Ohio. So, and I'm very excited because one of the 10 authors who was at our very first Ohio Minute Book Festival in 2007, um, this Monday won the Pulitzer Prize in Fiction, Tony Dorr. So we're very thrilled with that. So, so yes, a congratulations to Tony. So let's have a little conversation about what is going on in the literary world. And I'm going to start it off by talking about, you know, in the last 10 years, 10 years ago, there was no Kindle. There was no Nook. Um, there was no Goodreads. All of the things which have happened, which have really impacted not only the literary world, but the world of libraries as well, e-books and everything of that nature. So um, I thought I would ask my uh, compatriots what they thought are the uh, key trends which we're seeing in literature, um, particular, particular genres perhaps that are becoming popular that are, that are around the corner. You go first. I'll go first. Oh, pressure. Um, well, I think working with students a lot, I think technology um, is twofold. I think a lot of students love it because it's portable. They're reading on their phones. They're taking it in class when maybe they shouldn't be, um, but they're reading on the bus and things like that. So I think it's, it's great. And they've been able to download and get resources and books that they didn't normally get. And that's also is a little double edge, like we were talking about earlier with technology. Not everybody has that technology. So it's getting it into libraries and the in the hands of students who don't have um, those means or resources. So making sure that we have them at the libraries, um, the house we have iPads that we bring to libraries and programming so that they um, can use technology too. So it's expanding and giving um, a lot more opportunities, but we have to also make sure that everybody gets the same opportunities. Um, for, for us, I would say that uh, we have an um, annual circulation of 17 million, and right now, uh, 1 million of that are downloads. And our downloads for ebooks have really stabilized over the last couple of years. And what I see is that we're in this mixing bowl right now. And it's really not about the format, it's about what's convenient. And I was telling David, I um, was in New York this weekend. We have a, couple, uh, a series of photographs in our new Whitehall branch by an artist named Reiner Gerritsen. And he spent three years on the subway in New York taking pictures of people with books and, de and devices. And I did the same thing. I took my little you know, iPhone and I'm snipping pictures because it's a blending of what's convenient. For some people, having a book on a subway is easy. For others, it's the technology. And I think being able to blend both of those is really um, where people are going to be about what, what they can access and when, by and large, as we look ahead in the next few years. Can I, can I see a show of hands? How many of you read um, or have a Kindle or a Nook? Um, well, really a good. Good size. How many of you still, even though you know the technology is available, how many of you still prefer to read the old-fashioned book? Wow. Yes, that is. And so, you know, it's kind of like the newspaper. You know, I can I um, I subscribe to the Dispatch Online, but still, for some reason, you know, maybe it's a habit I picked it from my dad. You know, Sunday mornings, you know, the cup of coffee and the, the Dispatch and print and everything. So I I think uh, those of us who love books and they're going to be around uh, uh, for a long time. I was a uh, Impressed too and everything, the number of people who are writing. How many, how many people out there, if I can see a show, how many people somewhere in your closet have the great American novel you've written? Uh, yes, I, I knew there were some people out there. <laughs> yes. One of the things that struck me was this thing, you know, and I, I never heard about it until I, a, a young person came to our book festival. This, the, the NaNoWriMo, everybody know this, you know started in 1999 with 21 participants and within 10 years more than 200,000 people worldwide were taking part and writing more than 2.8 billion words so there's not only a lot of readers out there but we know there are a lot of of writers and uh, uh, so 
And one of the other things is self-publishing, and I know that's this thing we're actually seeing a lot of. What does the library, in terms of self-publishing, because I know there are more people that are coming um, to doing self-publishing, and how does that impact the library? Well, let me see how I can come up with an answer with that. I'm looking at Mary Helen over there because she oversees all of our collection. We get, uh, I will probably, I would say probably once a week I get a call of somebody saying I've published a book. And I think what we're looking for, we're a popular library, so we're trying to make sure that what we have is what people are asking for. We belong to a consortium of 17, uh, 14 other libraries in the central Ohio area who have a little more of that long tail that is often the self-published piece. But we, our goal is that 50% of our collection is out at any given time. We don't want to be a warehouse of books. We want those books in people's homes. So we need to be buying what people want um, are looking for and we have a new thing we implemented almost a year ago called quick pick which is on every Tuesday you get bestsellers and they just show up at your branch so that you may be able to stumble upon a new book that was just published because that way there's an element of surprise and discovery for people yeah, well, so self-publishing for us, and again, going back to students, just because that's my population, but um, they are actually going on to Amazon and doing Create Space or doing their own self-publishing, and um, it is really cool for them to have that empowerment. And obviously, the parent is behind them, but they put it together, and to see them of, and anybody can do it on Create Space on Amazon, to see them be empowered to start from the beginning, go all the way through the end, and it, it will probably not be the next great American novel, but for them, they have one copy, and they have maybe a copy for their grandparent, and it is amazing to see how excited they get. In some of our programs, they have a book that we print just in-house to give them at the end, and it doesn't matter if they're in a library, if they're in our camp, or whatever, and they just have one piece in it, they get so excited. So I think from a children education aspect, from having that ability to do self-publishing, whether it's on a Xerox machine, or create space on Amazon gives them that power and excitement for writing and then reading what they wrote to other people is really is really exciting and whether they continue to write and self-publish is where I hope obviously we hope that they continue to do but I think that's a great thing for us and for the library and for writers in general kids reading and writing that's what we want more of right um, in a few minutes we're gonna uh, move to the audience at questions um, but first I wanted to ask uh, my wonderful panel, a prediction, um, maybe not for this year, but, but for the next couple of years regarding literature, books, or libraries, or anything else. A prediction. <laughs> wow. Anything. Anything out there, right? A, a prediction that for, for libraries, books, whatever. Yes. I'm going to say Anne Hagedorn's book's going to be a bestseller. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> I'll do everything I can to help with that. <laughs> Uh, I will say, um, that gives me time to come up with an answer. Um, I think, well, go ahead. Do you want me to bail you out? Yeah, please. Um, <laughs> I, well, personally, I am hoping that the dystopian thing kind of um, takes a back seat and get some happier books. But um, at least in some of the literature, I am happy to see that there's a lot more diversity in not only a topic, but in um, things that are covered and by authors. They have Diversity Week, and they're really promoting having more diverse authors and topics that relate not only to students and um, you know, young adults and things like that, but also to adults. So I think that's really exciting to see that there are more voices covering more important topics, even as young as middle grade and young adults. So I'm hoping that that's a trend that keeps going. Okay, my prediction. The number one selling book of 2015, it's not even out yet, Go Set a Watchman by Harper Lee. How, many, have, how, how amazing it has been to see the explosion of news that was about Harper Lee and the fact that this other book that no one even knew about um, after all of these uh, decades and now um, there's going to be this, uh, this new book from Harper Lee and we always thought it was only going to be To Kill a, a Mockingbird. It is already number one in pre-ordering on Amazon.com and it's not even out until July. So I thought I was, that was kind of a safe prediction. But uh, uh, anyway, I would like to say, so um, it is CMC's tradition to take audience questions. If you would, please step to the microphone Give us your name and ask your question, and thank you in advance for not making long editorial comments, unless you want to say you really liked my singing. <laughs> okay. 
I really liked your singing. That was Thank you. wonderful. I'm Mark Allen. I'm a freelance copy editor. And uh, I should ask a question about copy editing. But really what I want is to be able on my phone or any device to, uh, when I find a book, go to the library and download it. And uh, I, I know for years there's been uh, is it Overdrive that uh, allows me to go and search for books. Like my I'm gonna, I'm gonna, great, okay. Um, so the, but, but the point is, it's the interface is difficult, and I know there's problems with publishers and getting permission and things like that, but really, it's kind of like the levitating skateboards. It's about time that we had that ability. <laughs> I could not agree more. I, um, com I've, it has always bothered me. I have a background in brand management, right? Why would the library say, now you go over somewhere else and you have a crappy experience? Well, how's that customer experience? But the horizon is changing. We are um, implementing a new product that is going to allow that integration of ebooks right into our catalog so that if you go to look for the next Harper Lee book, you can get everything no matter what the format is, and you don't have to go somewhere else. Um, so there is continues to be issues around publishers giving us, I don't, I don't get, this is one of those things, how is that still a thing? But um, publishers seem to think that if we have one copy of an ebook, you can only have one. And you can only check it out once at a time. And yet, we have like 10 copies of a book over here, and they go out to 20 million people. And so how is that a a reduction in my um, profit margin, whereas I got one ebook and only you can have it. So there's something that I don't under, it's a very small minded thinking anyway. Later this year, we will move to this new product and you will be able to do that. You're happy about that, aren't you? Good. And Jane. Very good answer. Thank you very much. I'm Jane Scott. Um, and I enjoyed your singing as well. Thank you for doing that. Um, <laughs> I guess the question, and, and I have to be a little careful how I ask this, uh, I usually take a fistful of books with me uh, along with my Kindle when we go on vacation. And a couple years ago, I have to say I got to probably the fourth book before I found one that was really worth my time reading. So my question is about quality. Um, you know, with all the self-publishing and there's so much being written now, the thing that discourages me from ever writing a book is like, holy cow, do I want to be on the bottom shelf at the thrift store in two years? Talk about the quality of literature that's being produced now. Um, is it, the proliferation, are we having any really major serious literary giants that are rising up? I, I said one time, you know, um, it, it's kind of interesting. Um, I had a stat here that said self-publishing has increased by 437% since 2008. I, I said one time if Ohio ever did a self-published authors festival, it would be the first festival where the authors outnumbered the audience. Um, but but the, the fact of the matter there is, is a lot of wonderful things that are being published that are self-publishing. The fact that something is not uh, um, picked up by a traditional publisher. On the other hand, as we said, you know, for those of us that take books into our collection, there has to be, because there is a cost. I don't know if anyone involves Ohio and uh, our collections, you know, comes in by, uh, by uh, donations, but there is a cost to actually put a book into your collection through processing, et cetera. So, so, so the thing is, you know, the quality level is a very important important factor and and the thing is hopefully and one of the things you know when you see the New York Times etc and obviously you see award I mean um, one of the authors who's coming to the Ohio a book festival um, this Saturday Celesting her debut novel was selected as the best book of 2014 so so you look at lists like that and you say wow the, so those kinds of books you know you can still pick out Tony Dore obviously winning the Pulitzer Prize so um, I, I guess with 300,000 plus titles out there, um, a lot of people are relying on libraries. I mean, the quarterly tries to make you know recommendations to people. So, um, if you're looking for guidelines, I guess where do you look? You know, if Meg, do do you get calls from people saying, "What would you recommend I read?" Um, not necessarily calls into my office, but from my friends a lot. <laughs> um, you had mentioned earlier Goodreads. That is a really good source of lists for things that you might like, it has reviews, um, things like that. I frequently go to the library's website to see what the librarians are reading. I also, my sister's also a librarian, so um, we, the librarians abound in my life, so I, I frequently ask them what they are reading. Um, 
but it's kind of the same way, just getting your information. It's, it's also kind of like movies. Um, there's tons of movies out all the time. Some go straight to the shelf for a reason. Some stay in the box office longer, and you just kind of um, find things that you like, and it's kind of a hit or a miss, but then you find other people who like, and you kind of start listening to what they say and what they recommend, and that's how I get a lot of my, my book. Reading. And I've also read Celeste Ng's book, and it's very good. Well, Jane, I guess my question to, back to you was, was to say, is there a particular kind of genre or uh, book that you enjoy reading most? You're kind of all well-crafted books. You know, that is, that, and that was a thing I actually was reading as I was preparing for this. One person said, said you know, was asking questions about genres, and they said, what are you looking for? Romance, mystery, science fiction. She said, I am looking first and foremost for good writing. And she said, and so she said, if I see good writing, the genre will not matter to me because what I, I'm looking for somebody who knows how to tell a story, develop characters, all of those other things, you know. If, if they are a nonfiction writer, you know, that they know how to craft it, you know. Anne Hagedorn is going to do, uh, be part of a panel called this narrative nonfiction, you know, writing a nonfiction book, but in a way that, you know, that it is, it is a compelling read. It's not just simply a collection of dry facts. So um, good writing is still the key, and, uh, and hopefully... Um, that's what, in the end, will win out more than the famous name author or this, you know, vampire romance or whatever the hot topic is of the moment. Yes, please, your question. Uh, uh, Lori. Uh, Lori Overmeyer, I also enjoyed your singing, David, although I've heard you do the duet with Billy Grove of God Bless America, and that tops Oh, What a Beautiful Morning, so I will say that. Um, I, al I also volunteer for the Worthington Libraries, a 2007 Library of the Year. Woo-hoo, yes, yes. I want to turn the table on the panel. What is the last book that each one of you read? I just finished Celeste Ng's book because I knew she was coming to Ohio Anna. It was very good. I need to have a deep conversation with her because it tore me apart. So I will be seeking her out on Saturday to talk to her about it. But I do recommend it. It was very good. But that was my last book. Um, I read constantly. I was telling Anne I'm a nonfiction reader. And um, I have a prevailing crush on David McCullough. And I have never read the Jonestown Flood, so I am reading that. And in true taste and form, it is magnificent. The last book I read, interestingly, because uh, I was writing an article for the Ohio and Quarterly's winter edition about Ohio and goes to the movies. And it was about um, films that were based on books by Ohio authors. And I read Shane. Um, how many people know that the, that the film Shane was written by Jack Schaefer, who was a journalist in Cleveland who had never written a book before, and his first book, Shane, is one of the, still considered one of the ten classic westerns of all time, so, and it was, it was a great book, and it really took me back, you know, to a wonderful time, that I loved the book, but I also love the movie as well. So it's very interesting. So the things that I found out, a very interesting thing, how many people know that Dog Day Afternoon was based on a story by an Ohio writer who teaches at Kenyon College, P.F. Kluge. A story called The Boys in the Bank was the basis for, for Dog Day Afternoon. So very fascinating. Yes, your question. Hi, I'm Catherine Moore, and my question is for Allison. Can you talk to us a little bit about I think we enjoy a tremendous amount of support in Columbus and have a property tax levy, if I have this right, that enables our library to be so strong. What happened with this latest round of budgeting? How did the next two years look for the other 50% of revenue? Do you know how that shook out? Well, our, um, our tax levy uh, was passed in 2010. So um, that's separate from state funding, which is out of the state budget. Um, that's what you mean, right? That's Did what you're talking about. this new state budget okay? Uh, I don't have the... It is just passing the House, I right. think, today. I was talking to right. Lee Leonard. Lee, was that, is, is, we're liking budget time this week, right? All right. But what I will say is that um, in the late 80s, Governor Celeste made it a um, priority to fund libraries. And so libraries have historically had really tremendous state support. Um, over the last 10 years, that support has changed as economies have changed. And um, I will say that 10 years ago, 
we were mostly funded by state, less by local levy. That has almost completely flopped. And moving forward and doing uh, uh, development, and that's we have a capital campaign in order to help with our building program. Chris Graves, uh, not that I'm a Luddite, but I like books on, I sometimes say tape, and I know now it's CDs. And I have a, com not a complaint, but yeah, I guess a complaint that um, there's not enough of them in any library. Because I live in Upper Arlington. Now that Arlington is part of that consortium, mm -hmm. I do have access to more. more right. But I just, I like being able to listen to them on CD as I'm driving, which I do drive a lot. And also when I'm cleaning house, I can put a CD. And I, and I am a nonfiction person, and I also love David McCollum, but I'm also into Walter Isaacson's oh, yeah. Einstein, great. Franklin. Right. And I'm listening to Hamilton, the book that the stage play is based oh, on. Uh -huh. Great, 700 pages, 29 discs. <laughs> yes. And I'm well, on if you the really want a good one. nonfiction that'll take forever, the rise and fall of the Third Reich, it's 43 CDs. Oh. And I have read them all, listened to them all. But I think the answer to your question is, um, books on tape are a lot. It's, it's, a, it's a very hefty production process. It's not quite the same as print publishing. They're expensive. They get beat up pretty quickly. So the investment in that isn't really at the same scale for that, a lot, largely for that reason. Could I make one final observation? Because I've talked a lot about Amazon Tom, Com today, and I feel badly because the official bookseller for the Ohio Minute Book Festival is Barnes & Noble. And Bar I want to thank John McDonough um, for setting up the book fair today with the authors and everything. I forgot to mention, John, thank you. And John has stayed here, so. Mindy, back to you. Well, this is a great forum. I'm sure you all enjoyed it. We encourage you to continue the conversation in the lobby with coffee and cookies. Those of you who know me know I'm a big fan of the cookies. Um, remember that you can view and share all of our forums on CTV Columbus Television, on WOSU and PBS affiliates statewide through the Ohio Channel, and anytime on CMC's website via YouTube. Before we conclude, please help me thank our sponsors once again, Columbus State Community College and the Columbus Foundation. And our great speakers, David Weaver, Allison Circle, and Meg Brown. And thanks to all of you for being here. We look forward to seeing you at CMC soon.